our patch. The hardest thing in the whole mission was to figure out what the patch was going to be like. And uh, the night before launch, going out, launch morning, after breakfast, everybody anxious to get strapped into the vehicle. We did have to get used to uh, getting up very early to support the early schedule. The, the pad 39, beautiful scene, the orbiter, launch morning, coming up to thrust, three main engines igniting, million and a half pounds of thrust roughly here, then plus the SRBs, <clears throat> 4.4 million pounds of vehicle pushed by roughly 7 million pounds of thrust. It was an exciting ride for us. The, uh, there was a lot of racket, shake, rattle and roll here. Very rapid uh, turn, or uh, roll maneuver that is, to head down range. <coughs> I think everybody uh, really enjoyed this first stage, first stage flight. That's the camera doing that. That wasn't us. <laughs> 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 sort of thing you'd like to do uh, over and over again. Believe me, this uh, going into orbit. We have uh, two uh, two waves uh, here in Congress uh, observing this. And we're almost to the, the place uh, where we finish first stage flight, jettison the SRBs and continue on. I think we had some cloud cover in the way there. There were some winds at altitude that really uh, blew around our smoke trail. There go the SRBs. And then we felt a very smooth electric drive which took us into orbit in eight and a half minutes and here we are with the doors open. This is uh, getting ready for the West Star deployment. And Ron, you might <coughs> like to carry on with this. We got into the West Star deployment on the first day. It was our first major activity, and things ticked along quite well throughout the entire deploy. These are the final moments of terminal sequence. All the spacecraft is armed, the deployment is armed, and we see a perfectly uh, smooth deployment, stable satellite. All systems just look perfect, and we were absolutely uh, pleased with what we saw with the West Star deployment. We tracked it out for many, many minutes after the deploy, as with the later deployment. This is going into the, uh, run, the IRT deploy, I think. We're showing uh, the <laughs> lower part of the cameras. Watch the IRT. That's the last we saw of it with TV. We eventually picked it up with uh, 16 millimeter, as you see here. And uh, Bruce, you might, or Bob, you might want to pick it up here. Yeah, it was supposed to deploy a pair of packing staves after 50 seconds and then inflate to a six-foot diameter sphere after 80 seconds. Instead, about six and a half minutes after we uh, deployed it, it exploded, and this was the fragment that we wound up tracking with the radar uh, out to some 50,000 feet. Bob? This is the uh, Palapa deploy, and like the West Star, it uh, was absolutely nominal from all onboard indications. We were very careful to do a lot of spec checks and uh, look very carefully because we'd known about the uh, problem with the West Star. Uh, we saw absolutely nothing on board that was wrong. Satellite spun up smoothly, as you can see here, and just like the West Star, it came out absolutely stable. And as far as we're concerned, that we had a, a good bird going at this point. Uh, from about this point uh, on, <clears throat> as the satellite clears the tail, we lose any uh, insight into what's happening on the top. So we were asked from the ground if we could observe uh, Omni antenna deployment, which we could not. This is the uh, TV that we picked up of the perigee kick motor burn right here, that ring that you see going out. Uh, we started thinking something is wrong, but, but on board we just didn't want to let ourselves believe that it had happened to us twice in a row. So we just uh, watched this thing uh, go dimmer and dimmer, uh, hoping that we had lost it in a, in a, a cloud of uh, rocket exhaust or something like that. And, uh, we stayed on this picture for quite some time afterward, hope, looking for some indication that uh, the motor was still burning. I add that we use the RMS camera to pick up that burn on the last sequence as we watch uh, Vance, Bruce, the mid-deck. Ron will show you a little bit here of what uh, Zero-G is like, as you've seen before. 
I might add, that's a North Carolina Aggie, <laughs> not a Texas Aggie. This is a Go Navy Chubb satellite that we devised on board. I, I, want to, I want to comment that they did this after I was in bed on the last night, so they didn't give me a chance to reclamor. Yeah, the rose in there represents the Rose Bowl where the Army-Navy game was played this year. <clears throat> this show's working out on the treadmill. Uh, we were very fond of the treadmill for uh, getting your heart rate worked up uh, and, and getting a little bit of exercise up there. The zero gravity is just too easy on your body, and you need to keep doing some of that. Here we have some in-cabin scenes. On the right is our little computer Spock that told us where we were over the ground at all times. Bob is... Uh, Working with that, at the same time, uh, drinking out of a drink drink bag. <clears throat> Here you have a, I don't know who's upside down. It's either it's either me or the photographer. Ron and I uh, were two out of three, so we were probably right side up. It turns out by this time in a flight, it doesn't matter who's upside down. We just as soon sit on the ceiling to eat lunch as not. Ron is having a, an orange drink, and here we have uh, Bob at the galley. Little KP, little dishwashing <clears throat> chores after the meal. Turn out that the, this galley is a, a fine idea. It's a good, it's a little bit easier to prepare food with it than, than it was in the past. There you see our trash bag, or one of them. Just like at home, we have to have a, a wastebasket. <clears throat> By the end of the mission, there were literally trash bags floating around the cockpit. And the alien creeping into the picture at the uh, upper part of the screen is uh, one pre-breathing Army Lieutenant Colonel. And we ran the cabin pressure from 14.7 down to 10.2 psi about a day before the EVA, so that Bob and I could then depressurize from 10.2 uh, down to 4.3 in the suit without risk of the bends. It uh, greatly uh, improved the flow of EVA operations, and I was even able to work on the checklist some while pre-breathing with the launch and entry helmet. Pre-breathing in the helmet gives you quite a bit of freedom of motion in the vehicle, so it's uh, a lot nicer than hanging on the wall for three hours in the suit. <clears throat> That's a little sound slate, a lot of movie production, big movie production going on in the, on this flight. This is uh, preparation for EVA. Go ahead, uh... Yeah, here we are preparing for EVA, having done the liquid cooling and ventilation garments. Uh, in, in space, you put your pants on both legs at the same time. We've got that on another movie camera, but not in this footage. The hatch leads into the airlock, <coughs> which is a structure about five feet in diameter and six feet high that can be depressurized independently of the main cabin and has another hatch on the backside that leads out into the payload bay uh, that you'll see in a couple minutes. There's Bob applying an antifog to the inside of his helmet. This is the view looking from the airlock out into the mid-deck. Vance was outside giving us, uh, reading the checklist to us as we were preparing to don the suits. And we got to look at what it looks like with Bruce and Bob doing their uh, equipment prep, EMU prep for the EVA. Preparation for the EVA went all very uh, well, completely nominal. <clears throat> All the check, you know, there are many, many more checkouts on the suits now than we used to have, and they were, they were flawless. This is coming out the, the hatch. That was the outer thermal hatch, the inner one having, the structural hatch having been opened a few minutes earlier. Basically, we came out and uh, picked up a 35-foot self-tending tether reel right above the hatch the task uh, you see me doing here, and then <coughs> separated uh, left and right to start on our respective tasks. Uh, my first task was getting the, the port side MMU ready to fly and uh, checking it out and starting into a, a check flight, followed by some translations up and down the, the payload bay and some longer range translations. The light on the back of the MMU is a locator light in case a we got to flying around in the darkness, so Vance could keep an eye on where we were. Basically, <clears throat> we were very pleased with the way the uh, MMU handled. It was uh, very much like the simulations at the Martin Company in Denver, uh, except that we did find that when translating with the attitude hull system activated, 
since we had built it <coughs> to conserve propellant by turning some of the thrusters off if you started to pick up a, a rotational rate, uh, this hadn't been, uh, been modeled in detail in the simulator. You got an averaged response, and of course here you could feel every little thruster coming on and off. Uh, but other than that, the flying characteristics were uh, virtually identical to the simulator, and of course here we had complete freedom to uh, turn somersaults and maneuver about all three rotational axes and actually the orbital mechanics uh, were much more realistic and of course the the quality of the visuals that is the scene was uh, was a lot higher here than in any simulator uh, here I am I guess uh, backing out uh, to 150 feet coming back in and then uh, out to 300 and coming back in uh, this is approximately the same sort of translation that the folks on the next mission the solar maximum repair mission will be faced with in moving from the orbiter over to the solar maximum spacecraft. It was uh, interesting uh, seeing Bob and Bruce uh, go out to 300 yards. It, uh, we uh, had some qualms about it before the flight. We were uh, <coughs> concerned to, to have a natural human being out that far uh, untethered, but uh, we had backup procedures to go get them if uh, anything went wrong with their equipment. So uh, by the time flight came along, we were quite happy with the idea, and it turned out to be not bad in practice. Okay, this is some footage uh, of the manipulator foot restraint in operation. Basically, this is a foot platform type device uh, that is held on the end of the remote manipulator arm and serves as a mobile work platform. This is... Uh my initial flight in the MMU, just translating slowly out of the flight service station, just getting the feel of the machine. Uh, more on the manipulator foot restraint, uh, exercising some of its mechanisms. This was used uh, to conduct a repair task simulating the repairs of the electronics box on the solar maximum repair mission. And we also made some measurements to determine the amount of force that can be input uh, before back driving the manipulator arm. In uh, the lower left center, you can see the fisheye lens of the Cinema 360 camera that was mounted in a getaway special container in the payload bay. And uh, the film footage from that has just been received back at the planetarium in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, and it's supposed to be quite good, although we haven't seen it yet ourselves. I believe this particular sequence was taken at the end of the manipulator foot restraint activities on the first EVA or spacewalk. And, uh, shows me being positioned back up by the storage container by Ron, who's inside driving the arm. And you might want to say a few words about the... Yeah, I uh, should add that uh, th we reduced this task to some very simple commands and between communication between Bruce and myself and Bob. And uh, it, w it was necessary to be quite precise and understand exactly what we both intended. But it was, in fact, uh, very simple, as long as that communication was well established. We, this was a pretty unusual maneuver here, going to the forward bulkhead of the uh, payload bay, and it took some uh, little acrobatics to, to to see those guys when they're positioned that forward, positioned that forward payload bay. But it worked out quite smoothly, and uh, we were able to get them positioned exactly where they wanted to go. And uh, that manipulated foot restraint turns out to be a very convenient, useful workstation. Back inside the cabin after the first EVA, uh, one of the tasks was to uh, recharge and replenish the pressure suits, or EMUs. Uh, this shot here shows reinstalling or installing a fresh lithium hydroxide cartridge, which absorbs the exhaled carbon dioxide in your breath, thereby partially revitalizing the circulating oxygen. <coughs> on the this, is, this is... Uh my flight on the second EVA, I just completed uh, some inverted dockings here. I wanted to see how the uh, the machine flew, and the only reference that you had uh, was strictly the Spas trunnion pin. Uh, this was done at night, so the uh, the area that I'm looking at down what would be below my feet here is, uh, is just pure black. So uh, there was no problem in maneuvering this thing, regardless of whether you had a, a nice reference uh, background to see how your movements were going over the bay or whether it was just pure blackness and... The only reference was the pen. This is a little footage from the first EVA that kind of snuck in here in the middle. 
Actually, I hate to take issue with Bob, but it's been scientifically determined. And if you look closely, you can see what I mean. That's not black, it's navy blue. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Again, uh, the second EVA, the uh, device uh, on the front of the MMU, which I can't see here right now. We'll see again in a minute. The so-called T-pad or trunnion pin attachment device, uh, which is being operated by the MMU pilot here, is a device which is adapted to grab a trunnion pin on the solar maximum spacecraft that was not ever intended to be used as a means of capturing or, or controlling the spacecraft, but was a handy structural point you know, normally used for lifting it on the ground or supporting it uh, in the orbiter. The T-pad represents a class of devices that can be used with the maneuvering unit to attach a grapple fixture to virtually any sort of satellite that is currently on orbit uh, and to stabilize uh, a large variety of, stat of satellites also to make it easier for the RMS to grab them. Uh, we exercised both the primary one, which is sticking straight out, and the secondary one, which is uh, 90 degrees down from the primary one, and basically are very happy that they function in the manner in which they're intended. Bob has pointed out uh, there is no up and there is no down in, in space. In the simulator, you can do this same sort of maneuver, even underwater, uh, but when you do, it's still fairly uncomfortable. All the blood rushes to your head because you really are upside down in, in 1G. And although you can do it, you don't like to fly around upside down for too long. In space, uh, there is none of that feeling of uneasiness. Uh, once you're accustomed to seeing the Earth rushing by at uh, 4 miles per second, and uh, you concentrate on the orbiter and or the, the spas, your reference is at hand, you feel quite comfortable flying around at the relatively slow velocities with respect to them. It's sort of like uh, two rather fast airplanes flying formation on one another. The reason for the slow movement here is primarily fuel. Uh, it takes a given amount of fuel to start you and a given amount of fuel to stop you. And uh, the faster you go, the more fuel you expend. So we tend to move kind of slowly to conserve fuel. So this is all the equipment that will be needed for the next mission, the satellite repair mission. And uh, we felt that uh, we filled those squares uh, qualification of the equipment wise that uh, are required to say that one can go repair, the next mission can go repair satellites. Putin, uh, Ron and I were inside uh, during all this time. Uh, Boot uh, was taking care of the ship. Any little uh, problem that came up with the ship's systems, he, he got a lot of good photography. You'll see the stills later. I think he'll probably be photographer of the year uh, based on some of those great EVA stills. Couldn't get those guys to hold still. <laughs> except when the movie camera was running, and then we didn't do much in the way of moving around. This is uh, making a so-called hard dock. Upper left is a foot restraint floating away. Uh, far way through the second EVA, I was stowing the T-pad, and I noticed it was gone. I said it slipped, and uh, then Vance uh, went into his rescue mode, which I would like to point out, uh, he certainly wasn't anticipating anything like this, but we had worked up procedures to rescue a crewman or an MMU should it get lost overboard, and uh, I'll let Vance pick up from there. Well, the orbiter uh, has this tremendous capability to go over and uh, get something, so we maneuvered this 200,000-pound-plus uh, orbiter over to pick up this uh, foot restraint that probably weighed a few pounds. And uh, it was uh, fairly uh, easy to do this, and... Uh, we lucked out in that we demonstrated that you could go rescue a crewman in the same way we uh, rescued the foot restraint. I guess it got about 40 or 50 feet away before you, you closed to bring it within my grasp there. That's right. Here we're uh, closing the payload bay doors. Uh, about time to come home. <clears throat> we had uh, spent nearly eight days in orbit. You can see the doors are uh, very flexible. They, they worked uh, beautifully. As a matter of fact, uh, we thought the, the, the orbiter 
had a few minor things go wrong, but uh, they were only minor. Uh, it, it just performed uh, magnificently. We're coming up on the entry sequence, and what you're going to see right away, we are on the dark side of the Earth, but the sky around us is glowing red uh, from the heat of re-entry as we're coming down. So like being inside a blast furnace. That's the view. What you're seeing is out the windows of the orbiter, and this is the uh, very hot plasma surrounding the orbiter as we come back down. We saw that from about 24 times the speed of sound down to 11 times the speed of sound. And uh, here we are coming over the over Florida. The long-range camera's on us. The body flap is down quite a long ways. The machine is still uh, supersonic. And now you can see the, the underside. Looks like an arrowhead, which is uh, has uh, very small wings for such a big vehicle. Here we are coming around the hack, as we call it, a, a, a circle to line up <coughs> for uh, the straightaway just prior to landing at uh, Kennedy Space Center. That runway didn't look near as big from there, by the way, <coughs> as it had looked from on the ground. These are lights that uh, we use for lineup. Uh, we, we also have automatic guidance on board that helps us, but <coughs> of course uh, we were manually flying the machine from about nine-tenths uh, Mach number on down. Yeah, Vance won't say so, but as you see on a second, two red and two white lights means you're right on the glide path. So he did a super job of uh, bringing the airplane in and landing it. It was... Uh, two red and two white. I think it was a real uh, thrill for all of us. Uh, we really enjoyed being able to come into the Cape. On the left, you see another light used for reference. Here the gear is coming down. Hoot put it down at about 400 feet. Uh, the ground cameras have us coming over the threshold here. A little bit of ground fog, but not, not enough to bother. Streamers coming off the wingtips. We're going to make them red and blue for the next mission. <laughs> <laughs> and the nose coming down and then uh, braking. We, uh, we just did light braking. We used up a large part of the runway, but we didn't really need to. We really enjoyed it on orbit. Uh, uh, I wasn't sure at one point we were going to get uh, Bob and Bruce in from the second EVA because they just wanted to stay out there so that we could come home like this. And the rollout, and uh, after about 30 minutes, uh, we came down the stairs. We weren't in a big hurry because we wanted to get our land legs back. Met uh, Mr. Abbey, the, our, our boss. <clears throat> Walked down the red carpet at the Cape. Then decided, well, let's take a look at the ship. See how it fared. We decided we'd better get back on the red carpet again. <laughs> <laughs> well, this uh, this crew adapted very well to space flight, and uh, I think we adapted uh, very quickly back to Earth again. We enjoyed the flight. <laughs>